one night there was a running battle with Molotov cocktails flying about and people with guns and descending down ropes from helicopters and hand combat on top of this old fort. It's uh, been a very colourful period in its history. Well, what do I do? Yeah. My name is Michael Sealand. I am the Chief Executive Officer of Avonco, and uh, my family owns Sealand. Okay, so what can you tell me about the history of Sealand? The history of Sealand? Oh, um, Sealand goes right back to 1966, uh, when my family first took over the fortress. We'd been in the pirate radio business before that, uh, on a fortress in the Thames Estuary called the Knock John Forts. And the government brought in the Marine Offences Act, which changed all the rules and regulations, the laws, the territorial limits. And my father thought, well, we'd better look for another fortress outside UK limits. And we came across this Fort Ruffs Towers. We took it over Christmas Eve 1966. And uh, then my father had this bizarre idea of turning it into an independent state, <laughs> and uh, which he did in 1967. playing darts <laughs> yeah, the men they, they must have, have I mean if it's if it's bad enough for four people I, mean, I can imagine a whole team contingent well they were out here for quite a long time as well there's four floors of accommodation on each leg um, with a generator room above then above, then below that you'd have the armoury and then an open void where the fuel and water was stored so you can imagine a hundred men in four rooms is not very nice at all no, pretty I mean, unpleasant they must have uh, gone crazy I, mean, I think some, some of them, them did I think that the story I heard that the guys that were actually out here were uh, uh, people that had been on land, uh, shore based gun emplacements and, and disappeared with the local girls and got drunk and God knows what else and absconded, so they sent them out here as punishment. Ah. Now that's the story I've heard actually from somebody that served out here, and he did two weeks and it sent him mad. And there was somebody that jumped over the side at one point and committed suicide. Really? So yes. In a sense, Sealand is a kind of a prison almost. I mean, it, I never said that. <laughs> well, it could I be, mean, yes. If you oh, haven't absolutely. got a boat, for instance. Oh, you're pretty well it. stuck. You're yeah. it's like Alcatraz. There's no escape. Yeah. There's no good jumping over the side. You break your neck when you hit the water and you'll end up somewhere in France or something if you're lucky. Have you ever been trapped on here because of bad weather conditions? Oh, frequently. That's quite normal in the winter. What's the longest you've been stuck on? Six months. Six months? But that was by choice. I just came out here and got on with my life and just wanted to sort of do a few experiments and things that I was doing. So I was quite happy just sat out here for six months. My father went to Austria to meet some German and Dutch business group that he was meant to be doing some business with. And uh, I think the, the typical German point of view at the time was, ah, oh, well, if it's an independent state, why, uh, why contribute to the Bates family's coffers? We'll just take it off of them. So they tried to instigate a coup. So they, um, I, was, I was actually on sea land on my own when this helicopter turns up. And um, the guy that was came down with the winter, I was a German tank assault of all people. And uh, when I was talking to him, another fellow came down and they showed me a telex that was meant to be for my father. And uh, I said, go back to Holland, come back tomorrow with my father and, you know, yeah, you can take a certain amount of control. And uh, he said, oh no, whatever, anyway, either way, they um, ended up in, in, this, in this room. And the guy stepped outside the door, slammed the door and put a camera tripod to the door handle. Steel room, steel door, steel door handle. And I'm out. That's about four metres from the seabed. That there, there's another, or whatever, ten feet. There's another chamber directly underneath here, which is actually on the seabed itself. 
This originally would have been the armory in here where all the, all the shells were stored for the, uh, for the main guns and the Bofa guns. And this in here would have been a store, which now is our, uh, our jail. And Michael was telling us he spent some time here himself. He got stuck in here. Uh, So, how many people have you, have you had in the, um, the prison over the years? No, it was a, a German and a Dutch guy that boarded us at one point. They were put in here and held prisoner for a few months. They were used, I think Roy used them as butlers more than anything else. He made them clean, clean his shoes and cook for him and whatever. And finally they were released. Is that the only two you've ever had? Yeah, the only two, yeah. We don't make a habit of it. <laughs> so then it was decided we'd go to Holland. So we went to Holland and I got back to England uh, a couple of days later, I suppose. And um, by which time my father got back just after that from Austria. And um, we planned to go out in a, in a semi inflatable boat and, and uh, scale just take it back again but the weather was bad and uh, <coughs> we were we got a phone call from Germany telling us there was going to be 10 ex-Belgian paratroopers with Uzi submachine guns going to reinforce the position the next day and all this kind of stuff and if we were going to do something we'd have to do it now you know, straight away so I told them it was basically impossible with the weather and couldn't be done put the phone down and we found um, a friend of ours John Crudson who'd flown in seven or eight James Bond films inside the warehouse, a really brilliant pilot, and we asked him to take us out there, and he said yes straight away. So uh, we took the doors of his helicopter and um, went out at dawn the next day, slid down ropes onto the top, and took him back. How did you take him back? Well, there was a there was a guy sleeping in a chair, much like up in a chair, he was dozing in a chair. As we came, we were flying a metre above the sea, just breaking daylight. And he told me this fellow that he woke up and the first thing he saw was a helicopter appear from under the platform and it frightened the shit out of him. And um, the pilot put it in the hover between the two 60 foot masts on the top. And uh, we, we were standing outside and the skids as it came up, up from under the platform, we threw the ropes down and slid down the ropes. And once you got on, on board, were you just able to, I mean, were you able to remove the people around We, uh, I mean, they were armed. We were armed. Um, we, basically overwhelmed and uh, there was a couple of shots fired and um, we ended up, we, we locked them up in the magazine, like the, the ammunition magazine down the bottom of the tower where we sorted the place out, they'd done an awful lot of damage. Don't, you might as well not go back home because you're not going to fit in the you know, society outside. 